Thank you. Thank you. Will you sit? Thank you. Thank you. I take it that that was a salute to antiquity. And uh, on their behalf, I accept it. Seriously, um, I salute all of those who have had to do with not just memorializing and perpetuating, but saluting the great life of Samuel Proctor. Our country has produced no one who has enjoyed so many places which really could have been considered the climactic posts of a life, as did Samuel Proctor. And in almost all of them, except one, he honored the place more than it honored him. My regard for the church would make the exception of the Abyssinian church. It honored him more than he honored it. But every other place, he honored the place more than it honored him. And coming to Atlanta is always, to me, a moving experience. Here, yeah, the first family of the America to be resides. I am perhaps the last of those who would have addressed Dr. King Jr. and Dr. King Sr. both as Mike and his mother as Alberta. And I am moved in coming here whenever I do. And I salute these honorees who uh, appropriately distinguished and each one distinctly distinguished. And I am pleased to come among you. It was um, Abraham Heschel in his time, uh, taught up at the, on the heights where my friend Dr. Cohn teaches and others, who used to say that every hour is loaded with peril and possibility because there is no moment not charged with the divine. And so it is, as we gather here today, in this magnificent gathering of so many uh, brightly distinguished people. It is not often recognized, I'm afraid, but our nation is at a perilous moment. Its greatest peril does not occur on the sands between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. Our greatest peril occurs in the fruited plains and the mountains, rivers, between the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. It is not the problem of our adventure in Iraq. It is derivative. Our central problem is the problem which has plagued every nation which has come to preeminence in history. The centuries do not know a single instance of a nation who has come to the supremacy of power and has been, has been spared or has spared itself the fatal sin of hubris and pride. This is the central problem. Who will speak to the nation? The so-called Christian right, which may be neither. Uh, hides its agenda under high sounding terms like I've mentioned, abortion and homosexuality. Who will speak to the nation? It may be only left. The only possible resource the nation has maybe, I'm not sure, but maybe black religionists. Not by virtue of color, 
by virt but by virtue of the fact that he, he marginalized and disregarded and disallowed community may be the only community equipped to speak objectively to a society of which it has not been allowed to be an integral part. And that is the day, the virtue of blackness. Not just color, but previous condition of servitude. When I came along, our black leaders were wrestling with the matter of theodicy of God's dealing with man and why were we in this country? Well, we may be in this country now to save it, if we will. If we have not been sufficiently drafted to into this materialism. In that book which Sam Proctor honored me in allowing me to be a part, I'm gonna to read to you a paragraph. Contemporary American culture can be fairly categorized as sensate hedonistic, secular, and godless. Sadly, the church and church leadership have made peace with this materialistic emphasis. We have mimicked the corporate culture and the consumer ethos with a blind servitude, and we have behaved in ways alien to the spirit of the Lord, of the Lord Christ. We look more like disciples of Charles Darwin than of Jesus of Nazareth. The price we have paid for this era as ministers is that when we invite others to join us in search of God, too often they have trouble taking us seriously because they have not recognized in us a hunger and a thirst for God. They see us rather succumbing to an easy conformity emulating a greedy, narcissistic, hedonistic culture and its idolatrous lifestyle. And so Sam Proctor speaks to us from his time in history about our moment in existence. And uh, I revel in the fact that he considered me a friend. And I live in the confident expectation that I have not seen the last of Samuel Proctor. Nor has he of me. He was at Virginia Union as dean. He became president.